Greetings, everybody. Hello, and welcome to Chilitracy. Happy Wednesday. How are we all doing? I hope we are all well. I haven't seen you all in a couple of weeks. Well, a week. I did not stream last week, for I was, um... Was I? So I was in Germany last week. Um, and then Huddersfield. Slightly less glamorous. Um, but yes, how are we all doing? Welcome in, all you lovely people, on this very, very cold Wednesday. Oh, excuse me. Let the yawning begin. It is... It is chilly now. Um, the weather has finally decided that... Well, I say finally decided. Suddenly decided that it is now winter. Properly. Um, we've got frost, and I think some of the country have, has got snow. Um, and it be cold. Um... But yes, hope we're all doing well. Your co-worker was named Employee of the Month, so you have cookies. Nice. Excellent. Um, oh, I'm glad you... Well, I'm not glad you missed me. But I missed all of you a lot, too. I did have a good trip, thank you. Yes, it was it was a lot of fun. Very good. Um, although Huddersfield is a place not particularly inspiring. Um... But yes, how are we all doing? Welcome in everybody. Who have we got? We've got everyone. We've got Andy, we've got Smallcock, we got Queek the Geek, we've got Parola. Who we have Llama. You looking out, it seems you have a oh god, words. Looking out seems like you have a little snow now. Nice. Hopefully not enough to, you know, grind everything to a halt, as tends to happen. Certainly in the UK. It's snow. Ah, what do we do? Um because we just don't we don't seem to learn that snow does happen here and um it might might be good sometimes to you know prepare for that but no we are we are not those kinds of people in the UK we do not prepare we just sort of panic should get some snow tomorrow nice Takes a lot of snow for everything to shut down. Yeah, well, I was gonna say you're kind of you're kind of used to it, aren't you? <laughs> it's like ten degrees out for you, Andy. Yeah, it's not too bad. Just rain and more rain. Yeah, I mean we've had a lot of rain. So um, now, <laughs> oh, now it is the time for snow. But yes, um, I hope everybody is, yeah, snuggled up warm. Good time zone, Lady Mephistopheles. I hope you are well. Sure the trains will stop once there is a bit of snow on the rails. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I had the... Uh, I say my trip was good. It was great until I had to do a return train journey. Well, it wasn't a return train journey, but... From Manchester. Which would be fine. My God. I have... I, that is the most hellish train journey I think I've ever been on in my life. And that's saying something, because I've been on some bad train journeys. But basically, the two trains before me were cancelled. And this was a train going from Manchester down to Bournemouth. So, like, a five or so hour journey total. Um, and everybody who was meant to be on the previous train, certainly previous two trains, was trying to get on this one. So it was completely crowded from the get-go. And there were only four carriages for a five hour train. And some of us had reserved seats. Lol. Trying to get to them. Nope. I was standing up um, completely squished for two hours before I even was able to try and get towards my seat. Um, and I was stuck standing up in the door area um, for those two hours. The whole journey was like almost four hours. Actually, I think it was over four hours, four and a half hours, possibly. Um, so for just about half of that, I was standing up. It was not pleasant. Would not recommend. Um, and I think it was due to staff, staff shortages. Woohoo. So, um, yeah, that was exciting and fun. Um, but everybody was, uh, who was in my sort of area was, was very, very like nice very nice about it very northern about it and very sort of like oh dear well what's going on with the world kind of thing which was quite funny but um it wasn't fun i will say also hello mary moss hope you are well uh glad i made it safely back home yeah me too thanks um yeah 
You're officially off work until early, early December. Yay! That's good. That means you get like, what, two weeks off? Huzzah! That'll be, that'll be fun. I hope you can chill and relax. You have acquired cat. Greetings, Sherlock Holmes. Um, but yes, so tonight we've got and you should have keys to your new place tomorrow. <gasps> very exciting. Gosh, you've got, you've got very, very exciting things going on. Very exciting indeed. Could be better, but you had a nice day at work and now to the stream. Oh, well, that's good. I'm glad we can we can help with, with making the day better. Um, and yeah, I'm very glad you had a nice day at work. Um, yeah, I'm good. Yours again. <sighs> right. So tonight I have just the one story for you because it's a little bit longer. Um, by a an author who I wanted to find out her actual first name because frankly there is nothing I hate more. There are many things I hate more, but one of the things I do not like. Oh, go grab some tea, Mary Moss. Good idea. One of the things I very much do not like is when women are referred to as Mrs. Husband's name. I really hate that. Really. So the name by which this author goes under for, in this uh, collection of short, uh, excuse me, collection of stories I have is Mrs. Henry Wood. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was a big yawn. Is Mrs. Henry Wood. However, her actual name is Ellen Wood. So I'm gonna call her Ellen Wood because we do not need to be giving her her husband's name, thank you very much. Even, like, she's even got his surname. Like, let her actually, actually have, you know, her first name, please and thank you. You can't help it when you're the child of Mr. and Mrs. Husband name, though. <laughs> yes. Um, but, yeah, I, I looked her up and she seems to have been pretty, um, um, prolific actually she she wrote quite a lot of things and um the one i'm going to read tonight is um from a collection of i think she did like six collections of johnny ludlow stories so it's it's sort of written from the the main character of these stories who's called johnny ludlow who i believe is a lawyer um, and it's kind of like, I guess it's sort of a little bit like sort of Sherlock Holmes type things. Like this is sort of a crime, I suppose. Um, but from a little bit more of a lawyer's perspective. Um, so I thought that was quite cool. It was like, again, these people, like a lot of what well, these people, women who have written a, a lot of similar things to say people like, well, Agatha Christie, obviously later, um, or Arthur Conan Doyle or any of these people who have written kind of selection uh, collections of stories where there is sort of one one main character who's like solving something or you know um, yeah kind of involved in some project John Grisham yeah exactly um, but you'd never hear of them so I I think I might dive into some of her stuff a bit more and have a have a, a look at it and see see what else she's written because she yeah she's written quite a lot but you know, we don't hear about women who's who have written short stories that much. So yeah, but yes, this this is a yeah, as I say, slightly longer story. So hopefully it'll it'll take us the whole stream. Um, hopefully not much longer, but we shall see. If we are all sitting comfortably, the text is pinned at the top of chat for anyone who would, wishes to read along. Um, Parola has put a link to a jigsaw for anyone who wants to puzzle along. Um, and yeah, I, I hope we're all, you know, sitting comfortably, have a tea, whatever. And I shall begin. The Ebony Box by Ellen Wood. Chapter One. In one or two of the papers already written for you, I have spoken of Lawyer Cockermouth, as he was usually styled by his fellow townspeople at Worcester. I am now going to tell of something that happened in his family that actually did happen and is no invention of mine. Lawyer Cockermouth's house stood in the Foregate Street. He had practised in it for a good many years. He had never married and his sister lived with him. She had been christened Betty, 
It was a more common name in those days than it is in these. There was a younger brother named Charles. They were tall, wiry men with long arms and legs. John, the lawyer, had a smiling, homely face. Charles was handsome, but given to be choleric. Charles had served in the militia once, and had ever been since called Captain Cockermouth. When only 21, he married a young lady with a good bit of money. He had also a small income of his own, so he abandoned the law, to which he had been bred, and lived as a gentleman in a pretty little house on the outskirts of Worcester. His wife died in the course of a few years, leaving him with one child, a son named Philip. The interest of Mrs. Charles Cockermouth's money would be enjoyed by her husband until his death, and then would go to Philip. When Philip left school, he was articled to his uncle, lawyer Cockermouth, and took up his abode with him. Captain Cockermouth, who was of a restless disposition and fond of roving, gave up his house then and gave up his house then and went travelling about. Philip Cockermouth was a very nice, steady young fellow, and his father was liberal to him in the way of pocket money, allowing him a guinea a week. Every Monday morning, lawyer Cockermouth handed for his brother to Philip a guinea in gold, the coin being in use then. Philip spent most of this in books, but he saved some of it, and by the time he was of age he had sixty golden guineas put aside in a small round black box of carved ebony. "'What are you going to do with it, Philip?' asked Miss Cockermouth, as he brought it down from his room to show her. "'I don't know what yet, Aunt Betty,' said Philip, laughing. "'I call it my nest egg.' He carried the little black box, the sixty guineas quite filled it, back to his chamber and put it back into one of the pigeonholes of the old-fashioned bureau which stood in the room where he always kept it, and left it there, the bureau locked as usual. After that time, Philip put his spare money, now increased by a salary, into the old bank, and it chanced that he did not again look at the ebony box of gold, never supposing but that it was safe in its hiding place. On the occasion of his marriage some years later, he laughingly remarked to Aunt Betty that he must now take his box of guineas into use, and he went up to fetch it. The box was not there. Consternation ensued. The family flocked upstairs. The lawyer, Miss Betty, and the captain, who had come to Worcester for the wedding and was staying in the house, one and all put their hands into the deep, dark pigeonholes, but failed to find the box. The captain, a hot-tempered man, flew into a passion and swore over it. Miss Betty shed tears. Lawyer Cockermouth, always cool and genial, shrugged his shoulders and absolutely joked. None of them could form the slightest notion as to how the box had gone, or who was likely to have taken it, and it had to be given up as a bad job. Philip was married the next day, and left his uncle's house for good, having taken one out Barbon Way. Captain Cockermouth felt very sore about the loss of the box, and strode about Worcester talking of it, and swearing that he would send the thief to Botany Bay if he could find him. A few years more yet, and poor Philip became ill. Ill of the disorder which had carried off his mother. Decline. When Captain Cockermouth heard that his son was lying sick, he being, as usual, on his travels, he hastened to Worcester and took up his abode at his brother's, always his home on these visits. The disease was making very quick progress indeed. It was what is called rapid decline. The captain called in all the famed doctors of the town, if they had not been called before, but there was no hope. The day before Philip died, his father spoke to him about the box of guineas. It had always seemed to the captain that Philip must have or ought to have some notion of how it went. And he put the question to him again, solemnly, for the last time. Father, 
said the dying man, who retained all his faculties and his speech to the very end. I declare to you that I have none. I have never been able to set up any idea at all upon the loss, or attach suspicion to a soul, living or dead. The two maids were honest. They would not have touched it. The clerks had no opportunity of going upstairs. I had always kept the key safely, and you know that we found the lock of the bureau had not been tampered with. Poor Philip died. His widow and four children went to live at a pretty cottage on Malvern Link, upon a hundred pounds a year, supplied to her by her father-in-law. Mr. Cockermouth added the best part of another hundred. These matters settled, Captain Cockermouth set off on his rovings again, considering himself hardly used by fate at having his limited income docked of nearly half its value. And yet some more years passed on. This much has been by way of introduction to what has to come. It was best to give it. Mr. and Mrs. Jacobson, sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Jacobson, our neighbours at Dyke Manor, had a whole colony of nephews, what with brothers' sons and sisters' sons, of nieces also. Batches of them would come over in relays to stay at Elm Farm, which had no children of its own. Samson Dean was the favourite nephew of all. His mother was sister to Mr Jacobson. His father was dead. Samson Reginald Dean he was christened, but most people called him Sam. He had been articled to the gentleman who took to his father's practice, a lawyer in a village in Ox Oxfordshire. Later he had gone to a firm in London for a year, had passed and then came down to his uncle at Elm Farm, asking what he was to do next. For, upon his brother-in-law's death, Mr Jacobson had taken upon himself the expenses of Sam, the eldest son. "'Want to know what you are to do now, eh?' cried old Jacobson, who was smoking his evening pipe by the wide fire of the dark, wainscoted, handsome dining parlour one evening in February. He was a tall, portly man with a fresh-coloured, healthy face, and not, dare I, I dare say, far off sixty years old. What would you like to do? What is your own opinion upon it, Sam? I should like to set up in practice for myself, Uncle. Oh, indeed. In what quarter of the globe, pray? In Worcester. I have always wished to practice at Worcester. It is the Assize town. I don't care for pettifog in places. One can't get on in them. You'd like to emerge all at once into a full-blown lawyer there? That's your notion, is it, Sam? Sam made no answer. He knew by the tone his notion was being laughed at. No, my lad, when you have been in some good office for another year or two, maybe, then you might think about setting up. The office can be in Worcester if you like. I am hard upon twenty-three, Uncle Jacobson. I have as much knowledge of law as I need. And as much steadiness also, perhaps, said old Jacobson. Sam turned as red as the table cover. He was a frank-looking, slender young fellow of middle height, with fine wavy hair almost a gold colour and worn of a decent length. The present fashion, to be cropped as if you were a prison bird and to pretend to like it so, was not favoured by gentlemen in those days. You may have been acquiring a knowledge of law in London, Sam. I hope you have, but you've been kicking up your heels over it. What about those sums of money you've more than once got out of your mother? Sam's face was a deeper red than the cloth now. Did she tell you of it, Uncle? He gasped. No, she didn't. She cares too much for her graceless son to betray him. I chanced to hear of it, though. One has to spend so much in London, murmured Sam in lame apology. I dare say. In my past days, sir, a young man had to cut his coat according to his cloth. We didn't rush into all kinds of random games and then go to our fathers or mothers to help us out of them, which is what you've been doing, my gentleman. Does Aunt know? 
burst out Sam in a fright, as a step was heard on the stairs. I've not told her, said Mr. Jacobson, listening. She has gone on into the kitchen. How much is it that you've left owing in London, Sam? Sam nearly choked. He did not perceive this was just a random shot. He was wondering whether magic had been at work. Left owing in London? stammered he. That's what I asked. How much? And I mean to know. Twon't be of any use your fencing about the bush. Come, tell it in a lump. Fifty pounds would cover it all, sir, said Sam, driven by desperation into the avowal. I want the truth, Sam. That is the truth, Uncle. I put it all down in a list before leaving London. It comes to just under fifty pounds. How could you be so wicked as to contract it? There has not been much wickedness about it, said Sam miserably. Indeed there hasn't. One gets drawn into expenses unconsciously in the most extraordinary manner up in London. Uncle Jacobson, you may believe me or not when I say that until I added it up I did not think it amounted to twenty pounds in all. And then you found it to be fifty. How do you propose to pay this? I intend to send it up by instalments as I can. Instead of doing which, you'll get into deeper debt at Worcester, if it's Worcester you go to. I hope not, Uncle. I shall do my best to keep out of debt. I mean to be steady. Mr. Jacobson filled a fresh pipe and lighted it with a spill from the mantelpiece. He did not doubt the young fellow's intentions. He only doubted his resolution. You shall go into some lawyer's office in Worcester for two years, Sam, when we shall see how things turn out, said he presently. And look here, I'll pay these debts of yours myself, provided you promise me not to get into trouble again. There, no more, interrupting Sam's grateful looks. Your aunt's coming in. Sam opened the door for Mrs. Jacobson. A little pleasant-faced woman in a white net cap with small flat silver curls under it. She carried a small basket lined with blue silk in which lay her knitting. I've been looking to your room, my dear, to see that all's comfortable for you, she said to Sam as she sat down by the table and the candles. That new housemaid of ours is all, not altogether to be trusted. I suppose you've been telling your uncle all about the wonders of London. And something else too put in old Jacobson gruffly. He wanted to set up in practice for himself at Worcester, offhand, red hot. Oh dear, said Mrs. Jacobson. That's what the boy wanted, nothing less. No, another year or two's work in some good house to acquire stability and experience, and then we may talk about setting up. It will be all for the best, Sam, trust me. Well, uncle, perhaps it will. It was of no use for him to say perhaps it won't. He could not help himself. But it was a disappointment. Mr. Jacobson walked over to Dyke Manor the next day to consult the squire as to the best lawyer to place Sam with, himself suggesting their old friend Cockermouth. He described all Sam's wild ways, it was how he put it, in that dreadful place, London, and the money he had got out of amidst its snares. The squire took up the matter with his usual hearty sympathy, and quite agreed that no practitioner in the law could be so good for Sam as John Cockermouth. John Cockermouth proved to be agreeable. He was getting to be an elderly man then, but was as active as ever, saving when a fit of the gout took him. He received young Dean in his usual cheery manner upon the day appointed for his entrance, and assigned him his place in the office next to Mr. Parslett. Parslett had been there more than twenty years. He was, so to say, at the top and tail of all the work that went on in it, but he was not a qualified solicitor. Samson Dean was qualified, and could therefore represent Mr. Cockermouth before the magistrates and what not, of which the old lawyer expected to find the benefit. "'Where are you going to live?' 
he questioned of Sam that first morning. I don't know yet, sir. Mr and Mrs Jacobson are about the town now, I believe, looking for lodgings for me. Of course they couldn't let me look. They'd think I should be taken in, added Sam. Taken in and done for, laughed the lawyer. I should not wonder, but Mr Parslet could accommodate you. Can you, Parslet? Mr Parslet look up, looked up from his desk, his thin cheeks flushing. He was small and slight, with weak brown hair, and had a patient, sad sort of look in his face and in his meek, dark eyes. James Parslet was one of those men who were said to spoil their own lives. Left alone early, he was looked after by a bachelor uncle, a minor canon of the cathedral, who perhaps tried to do his duty by him in a mild sort of manner. But young Parslet liked to go his own ways, and they were not very good ways. He did not stay at any calling he was put to, trying first one and then another. Either the people got tired of him, or he of them. Money, when he got any, burnt a hole in his pocket, and his coats grew shabby and his boots dirty. Poor Jamie Parslet, how he has spoilt his life, cried the town, shaking its pitying head at him. And thus things went on till he grew to be nearly thirty years of age. Then, to the public astonishment, Jamie pulled up. He got taken on by lawyer Cockermouth as copying clerk at twenty shillings a week, married, and became as steady as old time. He had been nothing but steady from that day to this, had forty shillings a week now instead of twenty, and was ever a meek, subdued man, as if he carried about with him a perpetual repentance for the past, regret for the life that might have been. He lived in Edgar Street, which is close to the cathedral, as everyone knows, Edgar Tower being at the top of it. An old gentleman attached to the cathedral had now lodged in his house for ten years, occupying the drawing-room floor. He had recently died, and hence Lawyer Cockermouth's suggestion. Mr Parslet looked up. "'I should be happy to, sir,' he said, "'if our rooms suited Mr Dean. Perhaps you would like to look at them.' I will, said Sam, if my uncle and aunt do not fix on any for me. Is there any subtle mesmeric power, I wonder, that influences things unconsciously? Curiously, curiously to say... Sorry. Curiously to say, at this very moment, Mr and Mrs Jacobson were looking at these identical rooms... They had driven into Worcester with Sam very early indeed, so as to have a long day before them, and when breakfast was over at the inn, took the opportunity, which they very rarely got, of slipping into the cathedral to hear the beautiful ten o'clock service. Coming out the cloister way when it was over, and so down Edgar Street, Mrs Jacobson espied a card in a window with lodgings on it. "'I wonder if they would suit Sam,' she cried to her husband. Edgar Street is a nice, wide, open street, and quiet. Suppose we look at them. A young servant-maid, called by her mistress Sally, answered the knock. Mrs Parslet, a capable, bustling woman of ready speech and good manners, came out of the parlour and took the visitors to the floor above. They liked the rooms, and they liked Mrs Parslet. They also liked the moderate rent asked for respectable country people in those days did not live by shaving one another, and when it came out that the house's master had been clerk to lawyer Cockermouth for twenty years, they settled the matter off-hand without the ceremony of consulting Sam. Mrs Jacobs Jacobson looked upon Sam as a boy still. Mr Jacobson might have done the same but for the debts made in London. And all this, you will say, has been yet more explanation, but I could not help it. The real thing begins now, with Sam Dean's sojourn in Mr Cockermouth's office and his residence in Edgar Street. The first Sunday of his stay there, Sam went out to attend the morning service in the cathedral, congratulating himself that that grand edifice stood so conveniently near and looking, it must be confessed, a bit of a dandy. For he had put a little bunch of spring violets into his coat, 
and buttonholes were quite out of the common way then. The service began with the litany, the earlier service of prayers being held at eight o'clock. Sam Dean has not yet forgotten that day, for it is no imaginary person I am telling you of, and never will forget it. I never will forget it. The Reverend Alan Wheeler chanted, and the prebendary in residence, Somers Cox, preached, preached. While wondering when the sermon, a very good one, would be over, and thinking it rather prosy, after the custom of young men, Sam's roving gaze was drawn to a young lady sitting in the long seat opposite to him on the other side of the choir, whose whole attention appeared to be given to the preacher, to whom her head was turned. It is a nice face, thought Sam, such a sweet expression on it. It really was a nice face, rather pretty, gentle and thoughtful, a patient look in the dark brown eyes. She had on a well-worn dark silk and a straw bonnet, all very quiet and plain, but she looked very much of a lady. Wonder if she sits there always, thought Sam. Service over, he went home and was about to turn the handle of the door to enter, looking another way, when he found it turned for him by someone who was behind and had stretched out a hand to do it. Turning quickly, he saw the same young lady. "'Oh, I beg your pardon,' said Sam, all at sea. "'Did you wish to come in here?' "'If you please,' she answered, and her voice was sweet and her ma manner modest. "'Oh,' repeated Sam, rather taking a, taken aback at the answer. "'You did not want me, did you?' "'Thank you. It is my home,' she said. Your home? stammered Sam, for he had not seen the ghost of anyone in the house yet, saving his landlord and landlady and Sally. Here? Yes, I am Maria Parslet. He stood back to let her enter. A slender, gentle girl of middle height. She looked about eighteen, Sam thought. She was that, and two years on to it. And he wondered where she had been hidden. He had to go out again, for he was invited to dine at Lawyer Cockermouth's, so he saw no more of the young lady that day, but she kept dancing about in his memory. And somehow she so fixed herself in it, and as the time went on grew in it, and at last so filled it, that Sam may well hold that day as a marked day, the one that introduced him to Maria Parslet. But that is anticipating. On the Monday morning, all his ears and eyes were alert, listening and looking for Maria. He did not see her. He did not hear a sound of her. By degrees, he got to learn that the young lady was resident teacher in a ladies' school hard by, and that she was often allowed to spend the whole day at home on Sundays. On one Sunday evening, he ingeniously got himself invited to take tea in Mrs. Parslet's parlour, and thus became acquainted with Maria. But his opportunities for meeting her were rare. There's not much to tell of the first twelve month. It passed in due course. Sam Dean was fairly steady. He made a few debts, as some young men, left to themselves, can't help making. At least, they'd tell you they can't. Sundry friends of Sam's in Worcester knew of this, and somehow it reached Mr. Cockermouth's ears, who gave Sam a word of advice privately. This was just as the first year expired. According to agreement, Sam had another year to stay. He entered upon it with inward gloom. On adding up his scores, which he deemed it as well to do after his master's lecture, he again found that they amounted to far more than he had thought for, and how he should contrive to pay them out of his own resources he knew no more than the man in the moon. In short, he could not do it. He was in a fix, and lived in perpetual dread of its coming to the ears of his uncle Jacobson. The spring assize, taking place early in March, was just over. The judges had left the town for Stafford, and Worcester was settling down again to quietness. 
Miss Cockermouth gave herself and her two handmaidens a week's rest, a size time being always a busy and bustling period at the lawyers, no end of chance company looking in. And then the house began its spring cleaning, a grand institution with our good grandmothers, often lasting a couple of weeks. This time at the lawyer's house, it was to be a double bustle, for visitors were being prepared for. It had pleased Captain Cockermouth to write word that he should be at home for Easter, upon which the lawyer and his sister decided to invite Philip's widow and her children also to spend it with them. They knew Charles would be pleased. Easter Day was very early indeed that year, falling at the end of March. To make clearer what's coming, the house had better have a word or two of description. You entered from the street into a wide passage, no steps. On the left was the parlour and general sitting room, in which all meals were usually taken. It was a long, low room, its two rather narrow windows looking upon the street, the back of the room being a little dark. Opposite the door was the fireplace. On the other side, the passage facing the parlour door was the door. On, on the other side of the passage, facing the parlour door, was the door that opened to the two rooms, one front, one back, used as the lawyer's offices. The kitchens and staircase were at the back of the passage, a garden lying beyond, and there was a handsome drawing room on the first floor, not much used. The house, I say, was in a commotion with the spring cleaning and the other preparations. To accommodate so many visitors required contrivance. A bedroom for the captain, a bedroom for his daughter-in-law, two bedrooms for the children. Mistress and maids held momentous, excuse me, momentous consultations together. We have decided to put the three little girls in Philip's old room, John, said Miss Betty to her brother, as they sat in the parlour after dinner on the Monday evening of the week preceding Passion Week. And, and little Philip can have the small room of mine. We shall have to get in a child's bed, though. I can't put the three little girls in one bed. They might get fighting. John, I do wish you'd sell that old bureau for what it will fetch. Sell the old bureau? exclaimed Mr Cockermouth. I'm sure I should. What good does it do? Unless that bureau goes out of the room, we can't put the extra bed in. I've been in there half the day with Susan and Anne, planning and contriving, and we find it can't be done anyway. Do let Ward take it away, John. There's no place for it in the other chambers. He'd give you a fair price for it, I dare say. Miss Betty had never cared for this piece of furniture, thinking it more awkward than useful. She looked eagerly at her brother, awaiting his decision. She was the elder of the two, tall like him, but while he maintained his thin, wiry form, just the shape of an upright gas post, gas post with arms, she had grown stout with no shape at all. Miss Betty had dark, thick eyebrows and an amiable red face. She wore a front of brown curls with a high and dressy cap perched above it. This evening her gown was of soft twilled shot green silk, a white net white net kerchief was crossed under its body, and she had on a white muslin apron. I don't mind, assented the lawyer, as easy in disposition as Miss Betty was. It's of no use keeping it that I know of. Send for Ward and ask him if you like, Betty. Ward, a carpenter and cabinet maker, who had a shop in the town and sometimes bought second-hand things, was sent for by Miss Betty on the following morning and he agreed, after some chaffering, to buy the old bureau. It was the bureau from which Philip's box of gold had disappeared, but I dare say you have understood that. In the midst of all this stir and clatter, just as Ward betook himself away after concluding the negotiation, and the maids were hard at work above stairs with mops and pails and scrubbing brushes, the first advance guard of the visitors unexpectedly walked in. Captain Cockermouth. Miss Betty sat down in an access of consternation. She could do nothing but stare. He had not been expected for a week yet. There was nothing ready and nowhere to put him. 
I wish you'd take to behaving like a rational being, Charles, she exclaimed. We are all in a mess, the room's upside down and the bedside carpets hanging out of the windows. Captain Cockermouth said he did not care for bedside carpets. He could sleep anywhere, on the brew house bench if she liked. He quite approved of selling the old bureau when told it was going to be done. Ward had appointed five o'clock that evening to fetch it away. They were about to sit down to dinner when he came, five o'clock being the hour for late dinners then in ordinary life. Ward had brought a man with him and they went upstairs. Miss Betty, as carver, sat at the top of the dining table, her back to the windows, the lawyer in his place at the foot, Charles between them, facing the fire. Miss Betty was cutting off the first joint of a loin of veal when the bureau was heard coming down the staircase with much bumping and noise. Mr Cockermouth stepped out of the dining room to look on. The captain followed. Being a sociable man with his fellow townspeople, he went to ask Ward how he did. The bureau came down safely and it was lodged at the foot of the stairs. The man wiped his hot face while Ward spoke with Captain Cockermouth. It seemed quite a commotion in the usual quiet dwelling. Susan, a jug of ale in her hand, which she had been to the cellar to draw, stood looking on from the passage. Mr Dean and a younger clerk, coming out of the office just then to leave for the evening, turned to look on also. I suppose there's nothing in here, sir, cried Ward, returning to business and the bureau. Nothing, I believe, replied Mr Cockermouth. Nothing at all, called out Miss Betty through the open parlour door. I emptied the drawers this morning. Ward, a cautious man and honest, drew back the lid and put his hand in succession into the pigeonholes, which had not been used since Philip's time. There were twelve of them, three above and three below on each side, and a little drawer that locked in the middle. Hello, cried Ward when his hand was in the depth of one of them. Here's something. And he drew forth the lost box, the little ebony box with all the gold in it. Well now, that was a strange thing. Worcester thinks so, those people who are still living to remember it to this day. How, was, how it was that the box had appeared to be lost and was searched for in vain over and over again by poor Philip and others, and how it was that it was now recovered in this easy and natural manner, was never explained or accounted for. Ward's opinion was that the box must have been put in side upwards, that it had, that it had in some way stuck to the back of the deep, narrow pigeonhole, which just about held the box in width, that those who had searched took the box for the back of the hole when their fingers touched it, and that the bumping of the bureau now in coming downstairs had dislodged the box and brought it forward. As a maker of bureau, Ward's opinion was listened to with deference. Anyway, it was a sort of theory, serving passably well in the absence of any other. But who knew? All that was certain about it was the fact the loss and the recovery after many years. It happened just as here described, as I have already said. Sam Dean had never heard of the loss. Captain Cockermouth, perfectly beside himself with glee, explained it to him. Sam laughed as he touched with his forefinger the closely packed golden guineas, lying there so snug and safe, offered his congratulations and walked home to tea. It chanced that on that especial Tuesday evening, matters were at sixes and sevens in the parslet's house. Sally had misbehaved herself and was discharged in consequence, and the servant engaged in her place, who was to have entered that afternoon, had not made her appearance. When Sam entered, Maria came out of the parlour, a pretty blush upon her face. And to Sam, the unexpected sight of her, it was not often he got a chance of it, and the blush and the sweet eyes came like a gleam of Eden, for he had grown to love her dearly. Not that he had owned it to himself yet. Maria explained. Her school had broken up for the Easter holidays earlier than it ought, one of the girls showing symptoms of measles, 
and her mother had gone out to see what had become of the new servant, leaving a request that Mr. Dean would take his tea with them in the parlour that evening, as there was no one to wait on him. Nothing loth, you may be sure, Mr. Dean accepted the invitation, running up to wash his hands and give a look at his hair, and running down in a trice. The tea tray stood in readiness, on the parlour table, Maria sitting behind it. Perhaps she had given a look at her hair, for it was quite, quite more lovely, Sam thought, more soft and silken than any hair he had ever seen. The little copper kettle sang away on the hob by the fire. Will Papa be long, do you know? began Maria demurely, feeling shy and conscious at being thus thrown alone into Sam's company. I had better not make the tea until he comes in. I don't know at all, answered Sam. He went out on some business for Mr Cockermouth at half past four and was not back when I left. Such a curious thing had just happened up there, Miss Parslet. Indeed? What is it? Sam entered on the narrative. Maria, who knew all about the strange loss of the box, grew quite excited as she listened. Found? she exclaimed. Found in the same bureau, and all the golden guineas in it. Every one, said Sam, as I take it. They were packed right up to the top. Oh, what a happy thing, repeated Maria, in a fervent tone that rather struck Sam as she clasped her fingers into one another, as one sometimes does in pleasure or in pain. Why do you say that, Miss Parslet? Because Papa... But I do not think I ought to tell you, added Maria, breaking off abruptly. Oh, yes, you may. I am quite safe, even if it's a secret. Please do. Well, cried the easily persuaded girl, Papa has always had an uncomfortable feeling upon him ever since the loss. He feared that some people, knowing he was not well off, might think perhaps it was he who had stolen upstairs and taken it. Sam laughed at that. He had ne he's never said so, but somehow we have seen it, my mother and I. It was altogether so mysterious a loss, you see, affording no clue as to when it occurred, that people were ready to suspect anything, however improbable. Oh, I am thankful it is found. The kettle went on singing, the minutes went on flitting, and still nobody came. Six o'clock struck out from the cathedral as Mr. Parslet entered. Had the two been asked the time, they might have said it was about a quarter past five. Golden hours fly quickly, fly on angels' wings. Now it chanced that whilst they were at tea, a creditor of Sam's came to the door, one Jonas Badger. Sam went to him, and the colloquy that ensued might be heard in the parlour. Mr Badger said, in quite a fatherly way, that he really could not be put off any longer with promises. If his money was not to be repaid to him, it was not repaid to him before Easter, he should be obliged to take steps about it, should write to Mr Jacobson of Elm Farm to begin with. Sam returned to the tea table with a wry face. Soon after that, Mrs Parslet came in, the delinquent servant in her rear. Next, a friend of Sam's called Austin Chance, whose father was a solicitor in good practice in the town. The two young men, who were very intimate and often together, went up to Sam's room above. "'I may say, my good young friend,' began Chance, in a tone that might be taken for jest or earnest, "'don't you go and get into any entanglement in that quarter?' "'What do you mean now?' demanded Sam, turning the colour of the rising sun. I mean Maria Parslet, said Austin Chance, laughing. She's a deuced nice girl, I know that. Just the one a fellow might fall in love with unawares. But it wouldn't do, Dean. Why wouldn't it do? Oh, come now, Sam, you know it wouldn't. Parslet is only a working clerk at Cockermouth's. I should like to know what has put the thought in your head, contended Sam. You had better put it out again. I've never told you I was falling in love with her, or told herself either. 
Mrs. Parslet would be about me, I expect, if I did. She looks after her as one looks after gold. Well, I found you in their room, having tea with them, and... It was quite an accident, an exceptional thing, interrupted Sam. Well, repeated Austin, you need not put your back up, old fellow. A friendly warning does no harm. Talking of gold, Dean, I've done my best to get up the twenty pounds you wanted to borrow of me, and I can't do it. I'd let you have it with all my heart if I could, but I find I am harder up, excuse me, harder up than I thought for. Which was all true. Chance was as good-natured a young man as ever lived, but at this early stage of his life he made more debts than he could pay. Badger has just been here, whining and covertly threatening, said Sam. I am to pay up in a week, or he'll make me pay, and tell my uncle, he says, to begin with. Hypocritical old skinflint, exclaimed Chance, himself sometimes in the hands of Mr Badger. A worthy gentleman who did a little benevolent usury in a small and quiet way, and took his delight in accommodating safe young men. A story was whispered that young M, desperately hard up, borrowed two pounds from him one Saturday night, undertaking to repay it, with two pounds added on for interest, that day month, and when the day came and M not, had not got the money, or was at all likely to get it, he carried off a lot of his mother's plate under his coat to the pawnbrokers. "'And there's more besides Badger that is pressing,' went on Dean. "'I must get money from somewhere, or it will pay the very deuce with me. "'I wonder whether Charlie Hill could lend me any.' "'I don't think so. Don't much think so. "'You might ask him. Money seems scarce with Hill always. "'There's a good many ways for it, I fancy.' Talking of money, Chance, a lot has been found at Cockermouth's today. A box full of guineas that has been lost for years. Austin Chance stared. You don't mean that box of guineas that mysteriously disappeared in Philip's time? Well, they say so. It is a small round box of carved ebony, and it is stuffed to the brim with gold guineas. Sixty of them, I hear. I can't believe it's true that that's found. Not believe it's true, Chance? Why, I saw it. Saw the box found and touched the guineas with my fingers. It has been hidden in an old bureau all the time, added Sam, and he related the particulars of the discovery. What an extraordinary thing, exclaimed young Chance. The queerest start I ever heard of. And he fell to musing. But the queer start, as Mr. Austin Chance was pleased to designate the resuscitation of the box, did not prove to be a lucky one. And I think that is where we shall take a break. This story may actually possibly take two streams. Um, I will see how my voice is feeling. Um, but, yeah, we might, we might stretch it over uh, next week as well. We shall see. But yes, hope you're enjoying so far. Um, and I also did quite enjoy that uh, Philip died of decline. And it was bad, so it was rapid decline. <laughs> it's like, great, perfect, love it. Also, Sam Dean's surname is D-E-N-E. -E, so sadly, not a supernatural crossover. Anyway, go do break-related things. And we shall see you back in about five minutes. Bye for now.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope you've had a good break. Done break-related things. Um, enjoying snow, if people have got snow. Um, yeah. And yes, it is. it does sound like it's doing cockroach from uh, Russian Doll. But, um... Kind of snowing off and on all day here, not sinking to the ground, just fallen trees and stuff. Nice. Also, hello, Angeline. Hope you are well. Um, but yeah, we, we have a mystery to solve. Well, I guess. How did the box reappear? I guess. But um, yeah, I think I think I might actually possibly take this one to next week too. Though it won't be very long next week. I might finish it next week and start another one. I'm not really sure. Um, or we can try and get to the end. Uh, let's have a look. Hmm. It's just an annoying length, this story. No, I think I think I'll I'll um I'll finish early today if everybody's alright with that. And then I will also do a shorter stream next week as well. If that's okay with everybody. Um just because I took a choir rehearsal yesterday and therefore had to sing and I have a choir rehearsal that I'm not taking but I'm singing in tomorrow and then I have a choir concert on Saturday. So I kind of want to keep my voice in decent shape, given that I'm singing top B flats in that. Despite the fact that I asked if I can, can I not do that, please. But you know. <laughs> anyway, take care of myself. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> um, I am. I am attempting to do that. Oof, indeed. Yes, Andy. That is the correct response. Oof. And we're, none of the music we are singing is easy stuff. It is crazy contemporary wacky weirdness. That means it's all jumping around. That is a high note. You do not like making high notes. Well, nor do I. But I can. So people go, hey, sing the thing. And the problem is I can also do the low notes. So they go, sing that too. And then my voice just goes, ah, don't like it. So, um, yeah. Woo. Um, ouch indeed. But yes. If everybody is uh ready Oh sorry. Oh yawn 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 yawn. If anybody is re everybody's ready then I guess we shall we shall continue i am currently using as because i've i've lost one of my bookmarks i have two but i usually have one to mark like um where i'm reading to in terms of the break and the one i'm currently using this isn't a bookmark this is a like a present tag uh which is actually fairly decent like card um that has a very good drawing that sam has done of a cow as drawn by um the far side cartoons so it's 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 a cow in the style of the far side cartoons and i'll have to take a picture of it and put it on the discord later because it's very impressive um he did a very good job there we go sam sam darley far side impersonator how about that anyway i hope we're all sitting comfortably and we shall continue with the ebony box chapter two the sun shone brightly on Fourgate Street, but did not yet touch the front windows on Lawyer Cockermouth's side of it. Miss Betty Cockermouth sat near one of them in the parlour, spectacles on nose, and hard at work unpicking the braid of some very old woollen curtains, green once, but now faded to a sort of dingy brown. It was Wednesday morning, the day following the wonderful event of finding the box, lost so long, full of its golden guineas. In truth, nobody thought of it as anything less than marvellous. The house cleaning, in preparation for Easter and Easter's visitors, was in full flow today, and would be for, mo for more than a week to come. The two maids were hard at it above. 
Ward, who did not disdain to labour with his own hands, was at the house, busy at some mysterious business in the brew house, coat off, shirt sleeves stripped up to the elbow, plunging at that moment something or other into the boiling water of the furnace. How could I have, how I could have let them remain up so long in this state, I can't think, said Miss Betty to herself, arresting her employment, scissors in hand, to regard the dreary curtains. She had drawn the table towards her from the middle of the room, and the heavy work was upon it. Susan came in to impart some domestic news. Ward says there's a rare talk in the town about the finding of that box, missus, cried she when she had concluded it. My, how bad them curtains look now they're down. Servants were on more familiar terms with their mistresses in those days without meaning or showing any disrespect, identifying themselves, as it were, with the family and its interests. Susan, a plump, red-cheeked young woman turned thirty, had been housemaid in her present place for seven years. She had promised a baker's headman to marry him, but never could be got to fix the day. In winter, she'd say to him, wait till summer, and when summer came, she'd say, wait till winter. Miss Betty commended her prudence. Yes, said she now, in answer to the girl. I've been wondering how we could have kept them up so long. They are not fit for much, I'm afraid, save the rag bag. Chintz will make the room look so much nicer. As Susan left the parlour, Captain Cockermouth entered it, a farmer with him who had come in from Hallow to the Wednesday's market. The captain's delighted excitement at the finding of the box had not at all subsided. He had dreamt of it, he talked of it, he pinned every acquaintance he could pick up this morning and, excuse me, and brought him in to see the box of gold. Independently of its being a very great satisfaction to have the old mysterious loss cleared up, the sixty guineas would be a huge boon to the captain's pocket. But how was it that none of you ever found it, if it remained all this while in the pigeonhole? cried the wandering farmer, bending over the little round box of guineas, which the captain placed upon the table open, the lid by its side. Well, we didn't find it, that's all I know. Or poor Philip, or poor Philip either, said Captain Cockermouth. The farmer took his departure. As the captain was showing him to the front door, another gentleman came bustling in. It was Thomas Chance, the lawyer, father of the young man who had been the previous night with Samson Dean. He and lawyer Cockermouth were engaged together just then in some complicated, private and very disagreeable business, each acting for a separate client, who were the, who were the defendants against a great wrong, or what they thought was one. "'Come in, Chance, and take a look at my box of guineas, resuscitated from the grave,' cried the captain joyously. "'You can go into the office to John afterwards.' "'Well, I've hardly time this morning,' answered Mr Chance, turning, though, into the parlour and shaking hands with Miss Betty. "'Austin told me it was found.' Now it happened that lawyer Cockermouth came then into the parlour himself to get something from his private desk table which stood there. When the box had been discussed, Mr Chance took a letter from his pocket and placed it in his brother practi practitioner's hands. "'What do you think of that?' he asked. "'I got it by post this morning.' "'Think? Why, that it is of vital importance,' said Mr Cockermouth when he had read it. "'Yes, no doubt of that. But what is to be our next move in answer to it?' asked the other. Seeing they were plunging into business, the captain strolled away to the front door, which stood open all day for the convenience of those coming to the office, and remained there whistling, his hands in his pockets, on the lookout for somebody else to bring in. He had put the lid on the box of guineas and left the box on the table. "'I should like to take a copy of this letter,' said Mr Cockermouth to the other lawyer. "'Well, you can take it.' answered Chance. Mind who does it, though. Parcel it, or somebody else that's confidential. Don't let it go into the office. You are wanted, sir, said Mr. Dean from the door. 
Who is it? asked his master. Mr. Chamberlain. He says he is in a hurry. I'm coming. Here, Dean, he called out as the latter was turning away, and young Dean came back again. Sit down here now and take a copy of this letter, cried the lawyer, rapidly drawing out and opening the little writing desk table that stood against the wall at the back of the room. Here's pen, ink and paper all ready. The letter is confidential, you perceive. He went out of the room as he spoke, Mr Chance with him, and Sam Dean sat down to commence this task, after exchanging a few words with Miss Betty, with whom he was on good terms. Charles makes as much fuss over this little box as if it were filled with diamonds from Golconda instead of guineas, remarked she, pointing with her scissors to the box, which stood near to her on the table, to direct the young man's attention to it. I don't know how many folks he has not brought in already to have a look at it. Well, it was a capital find, Miss Betty, one to be proud of, answered Sam, settling to his work. For some little time nothing was heard but the scratching of Mr Dean's pen and the clicking of Mrs. Betty, Miss Betty's scissors. Her task was nearing completion. A few minutes more and the last click was given, the last bit of the braid was off. And I'm glad of it, cried she aloud, flinging the end of the curtain on, to, on the top of the rest. This braid will do again for something or other considered Miss Betty, as she began to wind it upon an old book. It was put on fresh only three or four years ago. Well brushed, it will look almost like new. Again Susan opened the door. Miss Betty, here's the man come with the chintz. Five or six rolls of it here for you to choose from, cried she. Shall he come in here? Miss Betty was about to say yes, but stopped and said no instead. The commotion of holding up the chintzes to the light to judge of their different merits might disturb Mr. Dean, and she knew better than to interrupt business. Let him take them to the room where they are to hang, Susan. We can judge best there. Tossing the braid to Susan, who stood waiting at the door, Miss Betty, Miss Betty hastily took up her curtains, and Susan held the door open for her mistress to pass through. Choosing chintz for window curtains takes some time, as everybody knows whose fancy is erratic. And how long Miss Betty and Susan and the young man from the chintz mart had been doubting and deciding and doubting again did not quite appear, when Captain Cockermouth's voice was heard ascending from below. Betty? Are you upstairs, Betty? Yes, I'm here, she called back, crossing to the door to speak. Do you want me, Charles? Where have you put the box? What box? The box of guineas. It is on the table. It is not on the table. I can't see it anywhere. It was on the table when I left the parlour. I did not touch it. Ask Mr Dean where it is. I left him there. Mr Dean's not here. I wish you'd come down. Very well, I'll come in a minute or two, concluded Miss Betty, going back to the chintzes. Why, I saw that box on the table as I shut the door after you'd come out, ma'am, observed Susan, who had listened to the colloquy. Sorry, she went Irish there for a second. So did I, said Miss Betty. It was the very last thing my eyes fell on. If young Mr Dean finished what he was about and left the parlour, I dare say he put the box up somewhere for safety. I think, Susan, we must fix upon this light pea green with the rosebuds running up it. It matches the paper, and the light coming through it takes quite a nice shade. A little more indecision yet, and yet a little more, as to whether the curtains should be lined or not, and then Miss Cockermouth went downstairs. The captain was pacing the passage to and fro impatiently. Now then, Betty, where's my box? But how am I to know where the box is, Charles, if it's not on the table? She remonstrated turning into the parlour, where two friends of the captain's waited to be regaled with the sight of the recovered treasure. I had to go upstairs with the young man who brought the chintzes, and I left the box here, indicating the exact spot on the table. It was where you left it yourself. I did not touch it at all. 
She shook hands with the visitors. Captain Cockermouth looked gloomy, as if he were at sea and, and, had, and had lost his reckoning. If you had to leave the room, why didn't you put the box up? asked he. A box full of guineas shouldn't be left alone in an empty room. But Mr. Dean was in the room. He sat at the desk there, copying a letter for John. As to why I didn't put the box up, it was not my place to do so that I know of. You were about yourself, Charles. Only at the front door, I suppose. Captain Cockermouth was aware that he had not been entirely at the front door. Two or three times he had crossed over to hold a chat with acquaintances on the other side of the way, had strolled with one of them nearly up to Salt Lane and back. Upon catching hold of these two gentlemen, now brought in, he had found the parlour empty of occupants and the box not to be seen. Well, this is a nice thing, that a man can't put his hand upon his own property when he wants to or hear where it is, grumbled he. And what business on earth had Dean to meddle with the box? To put it in safety, if he did meddle with it and a sensible thing to do, retorted Miss Betty, who did not like to be scolded unjustly. Just like you, Charles, making a fuss over nothing. Why don't you go and ask young Dean where it is? Young Dean is not in, and John's not in. Nobody is in but Parslet, and he does not know anything about it. I must say, Betty, you manage the house nicely, concluded the captain ironically, giving way to his temper. This was, perhaps the reader may think, commotion enough over nothing, as Miss Betty put it. But it was not much as compared with the commotion which set in later. When Mr Cockermouth came in, he denied all knowledge of it, and Sam Dean was impatiently waited for. It was past two o'clock when he returned, for he had been home to dinner. The good-looking young fellow turned in at the front door with a fleet step, and encountered Captain Cockermouth, who attacked him hotly, demanding what he had done with the box. Ah, said Sam, lightly and coolly, Parslet said you were looking for it. Mr Parslet had, in fact, mentioned it at home over his dinner. Well, where is it? said the captain. Where did you put it? I, cried young Dean, not anywhere. Should I be likely to touch the box, sir? I saw the box on that table while I was copying a letter for Mr Cockermouth. That's all I know of it. The captain turned red, and pale, and red again. Do you mean to tell me to my face, Mr Dean, that the box is gone? I'm sure I don't know, said Sam, in the easiest of all easy tones. It seems to be gone. The box was gone. Gone once more with all its golden guineas. It could not be found anywhere in the house or out of the house, upstairs or down. The captain searched frantically. The others helped him, but no trace of it could be found. At first it was impossible to believe it. That this self-same box should have mysteriously vanished a second time seemed to be too marvellous for fact. But it was true. Nobody would admit a share in the responsibility. The captain left the box safe amidst, as he put it, a room full of people. Miss Betty considered that she left it equally safe, with Mr Dean seated at the writing table, and the captain dodging, as she put it, in and out. Mr Cockermouth had not entered the parlour since he left it, when called to Mr Chamberlain, with whom he had gone out. Sam Dean reiterated that he, he had not meddled with the box. No, nor thought about it. Sam's account, briefly given, was this. After finishing copying the letter, he closed the little table desk and pushed it back to its place against the wall, and had carried the letter and the copy into the office. Finding Mr Cockermouth was not there, he locked them up in his own desk, having to go to the Guildhall upon some business. The business there took up some time, in fact until past one o'clock, and he then went home to dinner. And did you consider it right, Sam Dean, to leave a valuable box like that on the table, unguarded? demanded Captain Cockermouth, as they all stood together in the parlour, after questioning Sam. 
and the captain had been looking so fierce and speaking so sharply that it might be thought he was taking Sam for the thief offhand. To tell the truth, Captain, I never thought of the box, answered Sam. I might not have noticed that the box was in the room at all, but for Miss Betty's drawing my attention to it. After that I grew so much interested in the letter I was copying, for I know all about the cause, as Mr Cockermouth is aware, and it was curious news, that I forgot everything else. Lawyer Cockermouth nodded to confirm this. The captain went on. Betty drew your attention to it, did she? Why did she draw it? In what way? Well, she remarked that you made as much fuss over that box as if it were filled with diamonds, replied the young man, glad to pay out the captain for his angry and dictatorial tone. But the captain was in truth beginning to entertain a very ominous suspicion. Do you wish to deny, Samson Dean, that my sister Betty left that box on the table when she quitted the room? Why? Who does? cried Sam. When Miss Betty says she left the box on the table, of course she did leave it. She must know. Susan, it seems, also saw that it was left there. And you could see that box of guineas standing stark, staring on the table, and come out of the room and leave it to its fate, foamed the captain, instead of giving me a call to say nobody was on guard here. I didn't see it, returned Sam. There's no doubt it was there, but I did not see it. I never looked towards the table as I came out that I know of. The table, as I dare say you remember, was not in its usual place. It was up there by the window. The box had gone clean out of my thoughts. Well, Mr. Dean, my impression is that you have got the box, cried the angry captain. Oh, is it? returned Sam, with supreme good humour and with just the least suspicion of a laugh. A box like that would be uncommonly, uncommonly useful to me. I expect, young man, the guineas would. Right you are, Captain. But Captain Cockermouth regarded this mocking pleasantry as particularly ill-timed. He believed the young man was putting it on to divert suspicion from himself. Who did take the box? questioned he. Tell me that. I wish I could, sir. How could the box vanish off the table unless it was taken, I ask you? That's a puzzling question, coolly rejoined Sam. It was too heavy for the rats, I expect. Oh dear, but we have no rats in the house, cried Miss Betty. I wish we had, I'm sure, and could find the box in their holes. She was feeling tolerably uncomfortable. Placid and easy in a general way, serious worry always upset her considerably. Captain Cockermouth's suspicions were becoming certainties. The previous night, when his brother had been telling him various items of news of the old town as they sat confidentially over the fire after Miss Betty had gone up to bed, Mr Cockermouth chanced to mention the fact that young Dean had been making a few debts. Not speaking in any ill-natured spirit, Quite the contrary, for he liked the young man amazingly. Only a few, he continued, thoughtless young men would do so, and he had given him a lecture. And then he laughingly added the information that Mr Jacobson had imparted to him twelve months ago in their mutual friendship of the debts Sam had made in London. No sensible person can be surprised that Charles Cockermouth recalled this now. It rankled in his mind. Had Sam Dean taken the box of guineas to satisfy these debts contracted during the past year at Worcester? It looked like it. And the longer the captain dwelt on it, the more and more likely it grew to look. All the afternoon the search was kept up by the captain. Not an individual article in the parlour but was turned inside out. He wanted to have the carpet up. His brother and Sam Dean had returned to their work in the office as usual. The captain was getting to feel like a raging bear. Three times Miss Betty had to stop him in a dreadful fit of swearing, and when dinner time came he could not eat. It was a beautiful slice of Severn salmon, 
which had its price, I can tell you, in Worcester then, and minced veal, and a jam tart, all of which dishes Charles Cockermouth especially favoured. But the loss of the sixty guineas did away with his appetite. Mr Cockermouth, who took the loss very coolly, laughed at him. The laughing did not mend the captain's temper. Neither did the hearing that Sam Dean had departed for home as usual at five o'clock. Had Sam been innocent, he would have at least come to the parlour and inquired whether the box was found, instead of sneaking off home to tea. Fretting and fuming, raging and stamping, disturbing the parlour's peace and his own, strode Charles Cockermouth. His good-humoured brother John bore it for an hour or two, and then told him he might as well go outside and stamp on the pavement for a bit. I will! said Charles. Catching up his hat, saying nothing to anybody, he strode off to see the sergeant of police, Dutton, and lay the case, laid the case concisely before him. The box of guineas was on the table where his sister sat at work, her work being at one end, the box at the other. Sam Dean was also in the room, copying a letter, that, letter at the writing table. Miss Betty was called upstairs. She went, leaving the box on the table. It was the last thing she saw as she left the room. The servant, who had come to call her, also saw it standing there. Presently, young Dean also, excuse me, also left the room and the house, and from, excuse me again, and from that moment the box was never seen. What do you make of that, Mr Dutton? summed up Captain Cockermouth. Am I to understand that no other person entered the room after Mr Dean quitted it? inquired the sergeant. Not a soul. I can testify to that myself. Then it looks as though Mr. Dean must have taken the box. Just so, assented the complainant triumphantly, and I shall give him into custody for stealing it. Mr. Dutton considered. His judgment was cool, the captain's hot. He thought there might be ins and outs in this affair that had not yet come to the surface. Besides that, he knew young Dean, and did not much fancy him the sort of individual likely to do a thing of this kind. "'Captain Cockermouth, said he, "'I think it might be best for me to come up to the house and see a bit into the matter personally, before proceeding to extreme measures. We experienced officers have a way of turning up scraps of evidence that other people would never look at. Perhaps, after all, the box is only mislaid. But I can tell you it's lost, said the captain. Clean gone. Can't be found high or low. Well, if that same black box is lost again, I can only say it is the oddest case I ever heard of. One would think the box had a demon inside it. No, Sergeant, you are wrong there. The demon's inside him that took it. Listen while I whisper something in your ear. That young Dean is over head and ears in debt. He has debts here, debts there, debts everywhere. For some little time now, as I chance to know, he has been at his very wit's end to think where or how he could pick up some money to satisfy the most pressing. Fit to die of fear, lest they should travel to the knowledge of his uncle at Elm Farm. "'Is it so?' exclaimed Mr. Dutton severely, and his face changed, and his opinion also. "'Are you sure of this, sir?' "'Well, my informant was my brother, so you may judge whether it is, like, it is likely to be correct or not,' said the captain. "'But if you think it best to make some inquiries at the house, come with me now and do so.' They walked to Foregate together. The sergeant looked a little at the features of the parlour where the loss had taken place, and heard what Miss Betty had to say, and questioned Susan. This did not help the suspicion thrown on Sam Dean, saving in one point, their joint testimony that he and the box were left alone in the room together. Mr Cockermouth had gone out, so the sergeant did not see him, but as he was not within doors when the loss occurred, he could not have aided the investigation in any way. "'Well, Dutton, what do you think now?' asked Captain Cockermouth, strolling down the street with the sergeant when he departed. 
I confess my visit has not helped me much, said Dutton, a slow-speaking man, given to be cautious. If nobody entered the room between the time when Miss Cockermouth left it and you entered it, why then, sir, there's only young Dean to fall back upon. I tell you nobody did enter it, cried the choleric captain, or could without my seeing them. I stood at the front door. Ward was busy at the house that morning, dodging perpetually across the top of the passage, between the kitchen and brew house. He too is sure no stranger could have come in without being seen by him. Did you see young Dean leave the room, sir? I did. Hearing somebody come out of the parlour, I looked round and saw it was young Dean with some papers in his hand. He went into the office for a minute or two, and then passed me, remarking with all the impudence in his life that he was going to the town hall. He must have had my box in his pocket then. A pity but you had gone into the parlour at once, Captain, remarked the sergeant, if only to put the box in safety, provided it was there. But I thought it was safe. I thought my sister was there. I did go in almost directly. And you never stirred from the door, from first to last? I don't say that. When I first stood there, I strolled about a little, talking with one person and another, but I did not stir from the door after I saw Sam Dean leave the parlour, and I do not think five minutes elapsed before I went in. Not more than five, I am quite certain. What are you thinking about, Dutton? You don't seem to take me. I take you well enough, sir, and all you say. But what is puzzling me in the matter is this. Strikes me as strange, in fact, that Mr. Dean should do the thing, allowing that he has done it, in so open and barefaced a manner, laying himself open to immediate suspicion. Left alone in the room with the box by Miss Betty, he must know that if, when he left it, the box vanished with him, only one inference would be drawn. Most thieves exercise some caution. Not when they are as hard up as Dean is. Impudence with them is the order of the day, and often carries luck with it. Nothing risk, nothing win, they cry, and they do risk and win. Dean has got my box, Sergeant. Well, sir, it looks dark against him. Almost too dark. And if you decide to give him into custody, of course we have only to... Good evening, Badger. They had strolled as far as the cross, and were standing on the wide pavement in front of St Nicholas's Church, about to part, when that respectable gentleman, Jonas Badger, passed by. A thought struck the captain. He knew the man was a moneylender in a private way. Here, Badger, stop a minute, he hastily cried. I want to ask you a question about young Dean, my brother's clerk, you know. Does he owe you money? Much? Mr Badger, wary by nature and by habit, glanced first at the questioner and then at the police sergeant, and did not answer. Whereupon Captain Cockermouth, as an excuse for his curiosity, plunged into the history of what had occurred, the finding of the box of guineas yesterday and the losing it again today, and the doubt of Sam. Mr Badger listened with interest for the news of that marvellous find had not yet reached his ears. He had been shut up in his office all the morning, very busy over his account books, and in, in the afternoon had walked over to Kempsey, where he had a client or two, getting back only in time for tea. "'That long-lost box of guineas came to come to light at last!' he exclaimed. "'What an extraordinary thing! And Mr. Dean is suspected of... Why, good gracious, he broke off in fresh astonishment. I have just seen him with a guinea in his pocket. Seen a guinea in Sandine's pocket? cried Captain Cockermouth, turning yellow as the gas flame under which they were standing. Why, yes, I have, it was... But there Mr Badger came to a full stop. It had suddenly struck him that he might be doing harm to Sandine, and the rule of his life was not to harm anyone, or to make an enemy if his own interest allowed him to avoid it. I won't say any more, Captain Cockermouth, 
It is no business of mine. But here Mr. Sergeant Dutton came to the fore. You must, Badger. You must say all you know that bears upon the affair. The law demands it of you. What about the guinea? Well, if you force me to do so, putting, in that, putting it in that way, returned the man, driven into a corner. Mr. Badger had just been down to Edgar Street to pay another visit to Sam. Not to torment him, he did not do that more than he could help, but simply to say he would accept smaller instalments for the liquidation of his debt, which of course meant giving to Sam a long time to pay the whole in. This evening he was admitted to Sam's sitting room. During their short conversation, Sam, searching impatiently for a pencil in his waistcoat pocket, drew out with it a few coins in silver money and one coin in gold. Mr Badger's hungry eyes saw that it was an old guinea. These particulars he now imparted. "'What did he say about the guinea?' cried Captain Cockermouth, his own eyes glaring. "'Not a word,' said Badger. "'Neither did I.' He slipped it back into his pocket. "'I hope you think there's some proof to go upon now,' were Charles Cockermouth's last words to the police officer as he wished him good night. On the following morning, Sam Dean was apprehended and taken before the magistrates. Beyond being formally charged, very little was done. Miss Betty was in bed with a sick headache, brought on by the worry, and could not appear to give evidence, so he was remanded on bail until Saturday. And that is where we shall end for tonight on that cliffhanger. Thank you for listening. Dun, dun, dun. Theories in chat. Did he do it, is the question. But yes, thank you very, not a cliffhanger, I know. Philip's ghost took it, absolutely, there we go, nailed it. Um, but yes, thank you all very much for being here and listening. Um, in theory, Sam will be back on Saturday with uh, another part of um, The Human Chord. Um, it's gross how obvious it would be, like the officer said, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, Sam will be back with more Algernon Blackwood on Saturday. Um, I shall be back with the second part of this next Wednesday. I don't think we'll raid tonight, if that's okay. I just need to just, you know, take a break. Um, but yeah, I hope everybody has a great rest of your day slash evening. Um, thank you all very much for being here. You're all wonderful people. Um, and yeah, we shall see you again soon. Good night.